Machiavelli is under no illusions about everybody having the capacity to do this. It's only the extraordinary individual, like himself, or like Caesar Borgia, or like a handful of the other great tyrants in history that have really shown us what human beings are capable of. Both Plato and Machiavelli are trying to show us something buried deep in the marrow of the human soul. At the very center of it, Plato thinks there's an eternal goodness, a final spark of the divine soul, which allows us to get some access to the mind of God and to the understanding of ultimate truth and wisdom. Machiavelli believes that at the core of the human soul, in the marrow of the psyche, there is a beast, an untamed animal, which wants only the satisfaction of its desires. In some respects, this is a very prescient theory because it anticipates many of the views that will later be held by Sigmund Freud. Underneath our superego, underneath this veil of civility, this veneer of righteousness, in fact, we are animals exclusively concerned with the satisfaction of our physical desires. We are beasts with a very, very thin shell of rational morality. Machiavelli suggests that we should become on the outside what we are on the inside, except in such cases when it's inconvenient. If it's convenient to look pious, gentle, kind, and good, well, that's just fine. The important thing is not to be gentle, kind, and good. The important thing is to be ruthless and rapacious and treacherous. Thou, nature, art my goddess, and to thy law my services are bound. That prayer was about the only prayer that Machiavelli could say with a straight face. Nature, red in fang and claw, is the goddess to whom his services are bound. But we are physical beings. We are not spirits in a material world. We are rapacious bits of meat that do whatever we can to take advantage of each other, except when we're deluding ourselves with things like morals, religion, kindness, gentleness, milk of human virtue, that sort of thing. But apart from delusions like that, and silly poetry appropriate for the feeble, the weak, the Christians in life, there's only blood, gore, power, the intoxication of not only surviving but conquering. If you are a good warrior, able to coerce other people, able to impose your will on a universe that is both indifferent to you and indifferent to any moral structure you might create, then and only then are you a man worth taking seriously. It is one of the most modern of political works. If we take for granted, and I think it a fair assumption, that at this point in time we live in a secular age, we live in an age which is contemptuous of metaphysics, which is contemptuous of references to abstract morality, then in some respects we live in a Machiavellian universe even if we have some sort of atavistic connection back to an earlier morality that meant something more than personal self-gratification. In that respect, Machiavelli is a very modern political thinker. He is the first political thinker to break from that metaphysical tradition towards a completely physical tradition, to move from a sacred politics to a profane politics. Or, you might say that he undoes the distinction between the sacred and profane by abolishing the sacred. So the world around us is neither sacred nor profane, it just is what it is. And you are what you are, and what you are, in fact, is a wolf guarding the sheep. If you remember the analogy that Thrasymachus makes in the first book of the Republic, that the ruler relates to the citizens that, he, that are his subjects the way a shepherd relates to a sheep or to a flock of sheep, he keeps them there, not because he likes the sheep, not because he has any moral obligation to the sheep, but because he likes pork, he likes lamb chops. He likes to turn these things into his sustenance. Well, other people, the subjects in the Machiavellian state, will exist only in order to satisfy the physical, carnal, carnal is a well-chosen word there, carnal desires of the Machiavellian prince. The centered, focused, fierce desire to satisfy your innermost longings. In some respects, Machiavelli is what people would be like in the Freudian sense if you took away the superego altogether, or if you only kept the superego, the conception of righteousness, of moral virtue, as a veneer to protect you from other people's condemnation. But what we are down deep is a mass of desires that we neither choose nor control, and human felicity simply exists in the satisfaction of these desires. 
Oxen are happy when you give them straw. Machiavelli is happy when you give them a government. Fundamentally, there is no difference. Each animal gravitates towards its own appropriate object. Machiavelli, in that respect, is, the, is an ancient political theorist and at the same time a modern political theorist. He represents nothing new in politics, but rather an ever-present temptation. It is always tempting for human beings to take the easy way out and decide that they're going to be meat, that they're going to give up the attempt to kindle the divine spark, which is what Marcus Aurelius called the soul, called the disposition to moral virtue. Machiavelli doesn't want to climb what Plato called the ladder of beauty in the symposium because he finds the world ugly, violent, and evil, and he likes it. So, in other words, not only does he know that he's in the cave, but he thinks that any attempt to move out of the cave is a kind of letting down of nature. It's an attempt to move away from nature towards some sort of chimerical, poetic, I know not what. And Machiavelli is, the saint, is a patron saint of all politicians who would be exclusively and immorally practical. One of the great difficulties in evaluating Machiavelli is to give him his due, in other words, to be intellectually fair to, fair to him, because he is a great genius. There's no way that we can honestly take that away from him. But it's also a mistake to say that while he's a great genius, we can, in practice, use this as a guide to life. If people were to take this seriously, and although God help us, some of us do, it would be a disaster for the social structure and it would be a disaster for politics. The difficulty is, is that we seem to vacillate between one and the other. When the better angels of our natures take over, we can see how Marcus Aurelius is a fine politician and how Plato offers us something real, solid, substantial in organizing our emotions, organizing our lives, organizing our standards of judgment. The problem is that we tend to vacillate back and forth. Every once in a while, when we think nobody's looking, we have a sneaking suspicion that Machiavelli may be right. Let him who is, out, who is without sin cast the first stone. I think every one of us has done stuff that we knew was wrong at one time or another. Machiavelli is saying, I wish to liberate you from the guilt of thinking that that is a mistake. Your mistake is in not doing that all the time. Do not succumb to the temptation to be an angel. You have no chance of doing that. You are meat. You are meat with a rational soul, but your rational soul is nothing that glows in the dark. It's nothing metaphysical. It's just the rational part of you that allows you to decide how to best satisfy your irrationally developed desires. So Machiavelli is a kind of standing temptation. He is a great political genius, and we must give the devil his due, almost literally speaking. The problem with this philosophy that I think even bothers those who acknowledge its brilliance is that it is an entirely hopeless philosophy. What can we expect from the next government? The same thing we can expect from this government, which is that it will be rapacious, that it will be treacherous, that it will be evil, and that it will be powerful, and that it will dominate us. The only way out of that merry-go-round is to dominate everyone else. Nature, red in fang and claw, enjoins us to make a meal of our own, enjoins us to become the wolf among the sheep. And if we have both the inclination and the unwillingness to philosophize in the platonic sense, then it seems to me that the only logical conclusion is the one that Machiavelli draws. So if you wish to go for the strictly physical, strictly anti-metaphysical politics, we're going to have a hard time connecting politics and ethics. One of the great achievements of Plato's Republic is that politics turns out to be ethics writ large. That what is good for the soul of the individual man, the organization of the reasoning, the spirited and the desiring parts, it also turns out to be isomorphically good for the society because we will organize the rulers, the rational folks at the top of society, we will have the guardians or auxiliaries, the spirited part, and we'll have the bronze people at the bottom getting as many of their desires satisfied as possible. For Plato, there's a one-to-one -one connection between politics and ethics. That will be true of all the metaphysical thinkers, also be true of the Christians. On the other hand, if one wishes to adopt the single world, entirely physicalistic interpretation of human life and of ontology and of politics, of necessity there will be a disjunction between politics and ethics. We will hear this again when we deal with David Hume's theory of justice. So if you wish politics to be moral, if you complain that politicians take too many bribes and cut too many corners 
and are unwilling to do what they ought to do and meet their moral obligations. You are implicitly making an argument which is founded on some sort of metaphysical conception, no matter how inchoate. You might as well fess up to it now. <laughs> You're all metaphysical <laughs> believers. If you don't wish to be a metaphysical believer, that's another possibility. Be careful you don't move down the slippery slope to Machiavellianism, because we move from the state of society to the state of nature, and the nature that Machiavelli has destined for us will be worse than any hell, because it will be immediate and tangible, and there's no way around it. It's a necessary element in the human condition.